The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, and thank you for joining us for our webinar on healthy eating. We're delighted to welcome accredited dietitian Adele Mackey from DAVIC to present the webinar for us. Um, just so we can check that you can hear the webinar, could you please click the raise hand button now if you have ever taken part in a webinar before? Excellent. Thank you very much. We've got a few raised hands here, so that at least lets us know that you can hear us. And um, also, just before we begin, um, we have Amelia Lake, a researcher from the Australian Centre for Behavioural Research and Diabetes, who would like to sit in on the presentation. If you have any objections to Amelia observing the webinar, then could you please type it into the chat box now? send it through to us and Amelia will withdraw from the presentation. After the webinar, if you have any, any questions, Adele will be delighted to answer these at the end of the presentation. If you think of a question, you can type it into the chat box, select the send to staff option and submit it to us at the end of the presentation. Now, I will hand over to Adele who will begin tonight's webinar. I hope you enjoy it and we're happy to answer any questions that might arise from the presentation. Hello and thank you Angela for my introduction. Um, so my name is Adele Mackey and I'm one of the dietitians here at Diabetes Australia Victoria and I've been working here um, for, for four years helping people um, with both type 1 and type 2 diabetes to um, manage their conditions. So I hope that in tonight's presentation um, you get a lot out of it and a lot of practical tips for, for healthy eating and, and lifestyle management to help manage your diabetes. So this is just an, an overview of what we'll be covering um, in tonight's session in the next 40 to 45 minutes. So just talking about the general healthy eating guidelines for people with diabetes, um, weight management and why that's important for, for diabetes, what makes up a healthy diet, um, talking about carbohydrates, sugars, the glycemic index, um, the different types of fats, sodium, alcohol, some practical tips to help keep you on track um, with your lifestyle changes, um, tips for eating out, physical activity and then we'll also touch on some of the programs that we run here at Diabetes Australia Victoria as well. So um, just this first slide to really touch on the three things that are important for the management of type 2 diabetes um, and just to just to say that there is no reason why anybody who's diagnosed with type 2 diabetes can't live a very long and healthy life and, and really not be fearful of all the complications that you might see that are advertised in the media. Um, and the way that people with diabetes can live a long and healthy life is by achieving and maintaining a healthy body weight or as, as close to your recommended healthy weight range as possible because we do realise that you know it's not possible for everybody to achieve their healthy weight range. Um, by maintaining Maintaining a healthy balanced diet or eating plan and being consistent with physical activity um, on a regular basis. So that's something that I really want to emphasize is the consistency with physical activity because a lot of people you know start off with, with good intentions of you know exercising most days of the week and um, and really you know if it, and it, it can come down to you know one or two days every now and again. So, but I'll touch on physical activity a bit more um, later on. So what is a diabetic diet? Is there such thing as a special diet for people with diabetes? Um, do you need to be cooking different meals to the rest of your family? Do you need to be buying special products? Um, these are all common, um, common questions that we get um, working at Diabetes Australia and we do have an information and advice line that people can ring up if they've got questions about it and that's the first thing people usually ask is what can I eat? But the good news is there is no such thing as a diabetic diet um, and healthy eating is the same for all people regardless of whether or not um, you have diabetes. So there's no reason why you need to be eating special meals compared to the rest of your family or buying special products or um, you know there's no reason why you can't have a slice of cake at a birthday party just because you have diabetes. Um, healthy eating exactly the same um, for everybody. 
Um, so this is just to, again, really point that out, is that the advice as dietitians that we give to people um, with or without diabetes is exactly the same, and it's based on the Australian Dietary Guidelines. Um, and these new dietary guidelines um, that you'll see just here um, in this poster were released earlier this year. They were updated and released in, I think it was towards the end of February or early March. Um, and it, the main guidelines were really, uh, you know, they haven't changed that much, but to enjoy a wide variety of nutritious foods. Um, where's my pointer gone? Oh, I keep losing it. Oh, there it is. To um, enjoy a wide variety of nutritious foods. And these foods that you'll see here um, in the circle are what we call our core foods or everyday foods. Um, and these are the foods that contain the most nutrition. So we've got our breads and our cereals group here. So not only does that include the obvious bread and um, breakfast cereals, but it also includes other grains as well, like quinoa, couscous, rice, pasta, whole grain crackers. Um, and these will be a, a great source of fiber if you're choosing the whole grain and, um, and low GI choices. And we'll talk about those a bit later on and why fiber is so important in our diet. Um, and then... And then next, we have our vegetables group, um, and it's important that we're, you know, including lots of vegetables right throughout the day. And vegetables are a great source of fiber, um, and they can fill you up for very little kil kilojoules or calories. Um, and they're a great source of antioxidants, vitamins, and minerals um, as well. And then our fruits, and it's important, you know, that all. All people with, uh, with or without diabetes are eating a couple of serves of fruit a day um, and there's no type of fruit that you need to avoid when you have diabetes. All types of fruits are good. We just need to be wary of our portion size. So, for example, you know, for a, a banana, if it's a really big banana, then cut it in half and that's most likely, um, you know, half a banana would be one serving. Um, or if you've got really small pieces of fruit, then a couple of small pieces of fruit would be considered one serving as well. Um, and then over here, we've got our, our dairy products, and it's important for everybody, um, regardless of their weight or regardless of whether or not they have diabetes, to be choosing reduced or low-fat dairy products because of the type of fat that's in dairy. And again, I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, and it's recommended that we have um, anywhere between two and four serves of dairy, depending on whether you're a male or a female. Um, and then over here we've got our meats and alternatives group, which are a really great source of protein, um, iron, um, zinc, and um, also that group also includes things like eggs and nuts and fish, um, as well as red meat and chicken as well. Probably one of the major changes that's occurred with the new dietary guidelines as they've been updated, and I keep losing my pointer, what is, there it is, um, with the new dietary guidelines is that they've actually separated out the fats and the oils from what we call our sometimes foods. So you'll notice that I've referred to these foods in the circle here as our everyday foods, and these foods down here as our sometimes foods. So I'm not referring to them as being good or bad or healthy and unhealthy, because I don't like to use those words. Um, it often, I feel, um, can set up guilt around eating these sorts of foods, and look, there's no reason why you can't include these foods down here in your diet on special occasions. So this includes things like alcohol, it includes things like takeaway, chocolates, biscuits, cakes, um, things that don't necessarily contribute a lot of nutrition to the diet, you know, but they're fun to include every now and again, especially if you're being sociable and, and for special occasions as well. Um, and, you know, that advice is no different to what I would give to people without diabetes as well. Those foods should really only be limited to special occasions and in small amounts. Um, but the fats and the oils, we have now recognized that um, they can play an important part in the diet, and I'll touch on that a bit later when I'm talking about um, the saturated and unsaturated fats. So one of the first, um, the first lines of treatment for people who are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes is um, aiming for a healthy body weight. So, um, so for people who are overweight when they're diagnosed with diabetes, then reducing your weight um, as close to your healthy weight range as possible is ideal um, because that will help to manage your diabetes a bit better as well. And, um, and I'll talk about in a minute the difference between um, the waist circumference measurement and, and your body weight and why that's important too. So a lot of you might have heard about the body mass index or the BMI 
and, um, and some of you might have even calculated it for yourself or, or had somebody calculate it for you. Um, but this is just really an, an indication, gives us a general indication um, about your risk for, for chronic disease and perhaps complications of diabetes as well. So the way that we work it out is that we take your weight in kilograms and we divide it by your height in metres squared. So just as an example, just say for somebody who's 70 kilos and 170 centimetres tall, um, we would di uh, divide their weight, which is 70, by this calculation down here, 1.7 times 1.7, because that's the height in metres squared, and it come up with a number. And this is just for people under the age of 65, um, this is what is indicated as being underweight, a healthy weight, overweight or obese. However, there are some limitations with using this measurement. Um, for people who are of different ethnic backgrounds, they will have um, different BMI cutoffs. So for people who are from an Asian or Indian background, um, their healthy weight range is considered to be anywhere between 18, 18 and a half um, to 23, so it's slightly lower. Um, and this is because studies show that people who are from these ethnic groups um, actually develop the uh, risk factors for chronic disease at a much lower BMI um, compared to other population groups. And on the other hand, people who are perhaps from a Maori, Tongan or other, other Pacific Island background have a higher BMI cutoff for their healthy weight range. So their healthy weight range is between 22 and 27. And this is because studies show that people from this population group don't develop the risk factors for chronic disease until they're at a higher BMI. One of the limitations with the body mass index though um, is it tells you nothing about where your body fat is actually distributed and it doesn't tell you anything about how much muscle you have compared to how much body fat you have. So um, the body mass index doesn't tell you whether the majority of your fat is, covered, uh, is found on your hips and your thighs or whether it's on your belly um, and it also doesn't as I said, give you any indication of how much muscle mass you have. So, for example, um, uh, if you did calculated the BMI of an AFL footballer, I can guarantee that their um, BMI would come up as being either overweight or obese. When clearly you look at these athletes and they're not overweight or obese, but they are covering, carrying a lot of muscle mass. Muscle weighs more than body fat um, and that actually gives them a falsely high BMI. So we can use it as a general indication for getting an idea of what somebody's health may be like, um, but we do need to look at that person and, and take into account, you know, what ethnic background are they from, are they carrying, uh, where are they carrying their weight, and also um, are they, um, or do they have a, you know, a bigger bone structure that's contributing to that extra weight, or is it a higher percentage of muscle mass? What we like to focus on more is the waist measurement um, and this is for, for a couple of different reasons. So um, the, the fat that we carry around our stomach area is actually very different to the fat that we carry around other parts of our body. Um, so when, when if you carry more fat around your tummy area, this type of fat is what we call metabolically active fat. Um, it actually releases hormones that increase our cholesterol, that increase our blood pressure that increase inflammation um, and also increases insulin resistance. So what this means for people with diabetes is there is an increased risk of um, heart disease in the, as you get older um, and it also means that with the increased insulin resistance, um, the insulin that your pancreas is producing to bring your blood sugar levels down isn't able to work properly. Um, and your body needs to keep producing more and more insulin. And the reason for this is because that fat that we carry around our tummy area actually sits on top of our organs. So it sits on top of our pancreas, it sits on top of our liver, um, sits on top of our stomach and it makes it a lot harder for our insulin to work properly to get to the glucose into our muscles and into our organs to be used as energy. And unfortunately when we lose weight, um, unfortunately we can't spot reduce it, it does come off from all over our body in small amounts and, um, and if you're consistent with your healthy eating and your exercise and you are carrying a bit of extra weight around the tummy area, then it can take time but it will come down. 
So you can see up here for men, um, we would like men to have a waist measurement of less than 94 centimetres and for women of less than 80 centimetres um, to help you know, decrease your risk of, of complications and to make your diabetes much easier to manage. People often find that as their waist circumference comes down, they decrease their insulin resistance and their blood sugar levels actually come down quite a bit as well. And like I said, this can take time, but you just need to be consistent and hang in there because often people, when they lose weight, will notice, you know, it doesn't seem to be coming off my tummy. It is, but it just takes a lot longer. So I think shows like um, The Biggest Loser have given people really unrealistic expectations for how quickly you can lose weight. Um, and, and you know, when if you've ever watched shows like The Biggest Loser, you'll see that they're losing six, seven, eight, sometimes even more kilos in a week. Um, now, for the average person who's you know working a full-time job, perhaps has children to look after or other family commitments, um, it's just not realistic um, to to fit in that much exercise and to have such a controlled diet. So um, I really don't like shows like that for that particular reason, um, and it's not safe to lose weight that quickly anyway. Um, one thing that I really want to highlight and up here is even just to begin with, a weight loss of 5 to 10% of what your initial body weight is can result in really significant health improvements. So although yes, over the long term we would like you to you know, get down to your desired waist circumference or we would like you to get down to your um, ideal weight range in the long term, so I'm talking maybe over an, a year or even longer, but initially just 5 to 10% of your body weight. So for example, if you weigh 90 kilos, it could be a weight loss of 4 to 5 kilos, can have actually quite significant effects on your blood sugar levels, on your cholesterol, um, on your blood pressure. So a lot of people think, oh, you know, I need to lose you know, 20, 30 kilos. But to really see those health benefits, it can be as little as 5 to 10%. Um, so just something to keep in mind as well. So what is the best type of diet for weight loss? I mean, I'm sure you've probably read a million things on the internet. You see different diet in magazines each week. Um, you know, there are new books that are always coming out. There's something on the latest morning show. Um, so really, what is the best type of diet that we should be following for weight loss? And look, the answer is there is no one best diet for weight loss. Um, Studies have shown that you will lose weight no matter what type of diet you're on. The key is actually being able to stick to it. And there's no, you know, there's no mystery about all these different types of diets. There's no secret. And if you look at them, the one thing they have in common is that they're probably all around about 12 to 1400 calories in total. So we're looking at basically just a low calorie way of eating. Um, and as long as you can stick to that, you're going to lose weight. Um, and the one thing that I like to ask people before they start any type of diet, and you know, I've I've got lots of friends who are always starting different types of diets, and I ask them, like realistically, before they start, is this something you feel like you're going to be able to stick to for the rest of your life? And often they'll tell me no. Um, and then I ask them, well, what's the point? If you're not going to be able to stick to it for the rest of your life, then what's the point in starting it in the first place? Because you'll probably just end up putting weight back on once you've finished it. So all these different types of fad diets that you'll see in the media, and they are fads, majority of them have no scientific basis. They might have you know, one study that's been performed on six people um, or just people testimonials. So that's not real hard scientific evidence. Fad diets often promote fast weight loss or a really quick fix, um, you know, lose, you know, lose six kilos in two weeks or, or something like that, um, which again, as I explained, isn't, isn't really that, um, that safe either. One thing that I forgot to mention when I was talking about rates of weight loss is you've probably all heard it before, but the slower you take the weight off, the more likely you are to keep it off. Um, and you know, it's not something that people want to hear because a lot of people do want to lose weight really quickly. Um, but when we lose weight, like it or not, we lose a little bit of muscle mass as well as body fat. And 
the more muscle we have, the higher our metabolism. So the amount of muscle we have really is the main determining factor as to how fast our metabolism ticks over. So if you lose weight really quickly, chances are you're going to be losing a quite a bit of muscle mass as well as body fat. And then what you've done is you've reduced your metabolism. And eventually, because you've gone on some sort of really crazy diet and you've lost weight really quickly and you've reduced your metabolism, you decide that you probably, you know, you can't stick to this type of diet because it's too restrictive. Um, and then you'll put on weight and you'll probably put on more than, than what you started with in the first place. And this is because you've lowered your metabolism. So the slower you take the weight off, the more likely you are to keep it off because you're actually maintaining more of your muscle mass. Um, and you're probably looking about half to one kilo a week maximum weight loss. Um, but often people will find that, you know, the weight may not change very much on the scales, but you might find that your clothes are fitting a lot looser or, you know, you you suddenly can go down a pant size or something like that. So the scales aren't often a good indication of how your body shape is changing. Um, and, and fad diets do often offer that fast weight loss quick fix and they're short term changes. So I, I rarely know of somebody who's stuck to a fad diet for more than, you know, six months at a time because they're often even socially too restrictive. So, you know, try going out for dinner if you're following a really low carbohydrate diet or you're cutting out this food group or that food group it, um, or you're going to somebody's house for dinner. It does become too hard. Fad diets usually exclude or severely restrict certain food groups or nutrients. Um, usually carbohydrates are a big one. Um, they often promote magic foods or combinations of foods and some of my friends that go on crazy diets are often telling me about some extract from a raspberry tea leaf or something that I've never really heard of before but, you know, claims to work wonders. Um, they often have really rigid rules that focus on weight loss, like you can't combine this nutrient with that nutrient and again it all becomes too hard and they're often based on, you know, one single study or testimonials. Meal replacement shakes are often ones that um, we get asked lots of questions about and there's so many of them now. You can buy them in the supermarket, you can buy them in Priceline, you can buy them in chemists and they've come in a wide variety of different forms as well from powders and ready-made drinks to soups, bars and biscuits. And there's no secret to why they work. They're portion controlled and they're very low in energy as well. Um, so they're very low in carbohydrate um, and may not be suitable for some people who are taking certain types of diabetes tablets or who are on insulin injections. Most of them aren't nutritionally complete, so meaning that they really don't have a full variety of vitamins and minerals in there that you need to maintain your health. So you usually need to eat extra vegetables and some of them you even require extra supplements like vitamin and mineral replacement supplements. And they certainly don't give you the health benefits of eating whole foods either. So when we eat whole foods, so when we're eating... Um, you know, a variety of fruits and veggies. There's a whole lot of interactions that occur within our body to produce antioxidants and, and other chemical reactions to, to help keep us healthy. They don't teach you how to choose healthy foods or make healthy lifestyle changes. So a lot of people will go on these um, meal replacement shakes in, in the short term but, you know, still have not been given any education around portion control or how to make healthy food choices or to read labels. Um, and eventually they come off the shakes and go back to eating the way they were in the first place. So, um, and they also can be very expensive. Some people have actually told me that it's much more expensive than just buying healthy foods in the first place. Um, they're not suitable for people who have liver or kidney problems and they're not meant to be used forever. So the only ones that dietitians usually recommend are OptiFast or OptiSlim um, and they're really to be used under the guidance of the dietitian so they can guide you through the three phases and teach you how to introduce foods so that you don't put the weight back on after you've been on them. So there have been studies done on people who have lost weight successfully and kept it off um, and the studies show that people who lose weight and keep it off are those that eat breakfast every day um, and again it's probably something that you've heard so many times or your mum's probably told you make sure you eat breakfast every day before you leave the house but it really is the most important meal of the day because studies show people who skip breakfast do tend to overeat later in the day and you really need to kickstart your metabolism after you've been fasting all night while sleeping as well. 
Um, people also monitor their weight regularly. So whilst you're trying to lose weight, it could mean that you weigh yourself once a week and no more than once a week because your weight can fluctuate on a daily basis. But once you've reached your goal weight, it might mean that you just hop on the scales once a month just to make sure that you're still tracking along the right path. They watch less than 10 hours of TV per week and I'm going to talk about why that's important a bit later on. Exercise on average for about an hour a day. Um, and this is most days of the week because this will be important to help keep the weight off. And they continue to consume a lower calorie diet with reduced portion sizes of meals and by choosing healthier food choices. So what about portion sizes? Because they've certainly increased um, a lot over the last 50 years. This is just one example of, of, of portion control and you can see here that we've got three different sized um, chocolate bars. We've got your little fun sized chocolate bars, your medium size and then often you can get your king size or, or your twin pack chocolate bars. Just to show you how many calories um, are, are in these sorts of foods. So a little snack size or fun size chocolate bar has about 73 calories and only about 8.5 grams of carbohydrates. So that's probably equivalent to say a, a mandarin um, as an example. And when I tell people you know, with diabetes or even without diabetes, if you feel like a piece of chocolate, then just have something like a fun size chocolate bar um, you know, once a week or something to really satisfy your chocolate craving. And eat it at a time when you can really enjoy it as well. So don't just eat it whilst you're in front of the computer or reading a book, but actually sit down and take the time to enjoy it. Then if you look at your regular size chocolate bar, so the next size up, 313 calories. So for somebody who was wanting to lose weight, 313 calories is about a whole meal. So if you're eating that in between your meals, um, then that's really, you, you're, just, you're adding an additional meal on top of um, what you're already eating. And then you can see once you go up to the king size or the twin pack, that's 402 calories. Um, and then you look at the carbohydrate as that in increases as well. And um, 8.5 grams of carbohydrate in the fun size isn't likely to send your sugars up through the roof at all. But certainly once you get to 36 or, or 46, if you're eating that in between meals, then that might start to affect your sugar levels. This is just one simple method that dietitians often use to educate um, people both with and without diabetes on, on portions control. And one thing that I want to point out before I, I explain this diagram is in terms of the size of our plates and our bowls. So I always give this example of, um, you know, when I go to visit my grandma um, who still has the same the same plates and bowls and the same sets that she was given when, when she got married 61 years ago and I compare them to what I've got at home when I've just recently moved house and her plates and bowls are so much smaller than, than what I've got in my brand new set and often if you've got a bigger plate or a bigger bowl you just tend to fill it without even realising it and then you'll just eat it because that's what you've served yourself. Um, so a good way to help reduce your portion sizes is to actually use a smaller plate or a smaller bowl because if you put a small meal on a big plate you're going to look at that and say oh well geez I think I might be hungry after I finish dinner whereas if you use a smaller plate but fill it up it sounds silly but you actually trick your mind into thinking that you're having more to eat and I often do that with my muesli in the morning I put it in a small bowl because a half a cup of muesli in a big bowl really looks like a minuscule portion and I find it works for me it actually helps to make me feel fuller if I looks like I've got a bigger bowl. So if you have your smaller plate um, and it might mean that you either need to use a bread and butter plate or if you go to an op shop and get an old set or maybe still your grandparents. Um, so if you've got this plate and you divide it into a half and a half your plate should be filled with vegetables or salad. So and by vegetables I mean non-starchy veggies. So anything except potato, sweet potato or corn, you can really fill up as much of your plate with those vegetables as you like. Um, and then you've got your carbohydrate portion, so whether that's rice, pasta, bread, potatoes or grains um, and that's roughly about the size of your fist when you clench it up um, or you're probably looking at maybe about one cup of cooked pasta, maybe about half to three quarters of a cup of cooked rice, um, a few small pieces of potato. So if you picture the size of an egg um, as being a piece of potato, then maybe two or three pieces of potato that size. So and that should take up about a quarter of your plate. 
And then of course you've got your protein portion. So whether that's meat, chicken, fish, eggs, um, or legumes or lentils. Um, and that should be about the size of your palm. So just the, yeah, not your whole hand, but the size of your palm for your protein portion there. And that's just to show you pictorially what that looks like. So you've got your half plate of non-starchy veggies there, your palm-sized piece of protein, and this would be equivalent to two or three pieces of small potato there, that medium-sized potato. So now let's talk about carbohydrates. So why are carbs important. So they are a vital fuel for all our body tissues. So it's the petrol that our body prefers to run from, um, but especially our brain. Our brain does need a certain amount of carbohydrate each day to function well. However, all carbohydrate foods will be converted to glucose and released into the bloodstream. Um, and I'll talk about sources of carbohydrate in a minute. So carbohydrates are the one nutrient that will affect sugar levels or blood glucose levels, but this doesn't mean we need to cut them out because they are an important source of fuel. So what are our carbohydrate containing foods? So you can see here um, on the left we've got our core foods like bread and breakfast cereals, pasta, rice and other types of grains and these are all starchy carbohydrate foods. And then we've got things like fruits which has the natural sugar called fructose, milk and yogurt, yogurt which has a natural sugar called lactose, our starchy veggies like potatoes, sweet potato and corn, lentils and legumes and whole grain crackers. So these, if we're choosing the whole grain, high fibre, low GI choices, are going to give us the most nutrients that we need. Great sources of fibre, B group vitamins and whole grain antioxidants. And these are our special occasion foods. So things that we really do need to limit to special occasions or maybe once a week or once a fortnight. Um, and again, that's no different to what I'd be recommending to people without diabetes as well. Our non-carbohydrate foods, so important to note that these foods will not affect sugar levels. So things like meat, chicken, fish, eggs, cheese. Um, Non-starchy veggies, um, such as green veggies, salad vegetables, tomatoes, carrots, mushrooms, cauliflower, um, nuts, and you can see there's a little asterisk next to nuts because a couple of types of nuts do contain a little bit of carbohydrate and they are peanuts and cashews, but you need to eat them in quite large quantities before they started to affect your sugar levels. So I'm talking about two cups worth of nuts. Um, Things that are purely fat and oil, such as margarine, butter, cream. Some types of fruits, like strawberries, lemon, lime, passion fruit, rhubarb, have very minimal carbohydrate. Um, things like, um, you know, flavour enhancers and fluids such as black tea, black coffee, diet cordial, um, diet soft drinks. So what about the GI or the glycemic index? So um, the glycemic index really is a measure of how quickly these carbohydrate foods are broken down and released into the bloodstream. So it's important to note that only carbohydrate foods will have a glycemic index. So things like meat, chicken, fish, eggs, um, cheese won't have a GI because they don't have any carbohydrate. So foods that are broken down really quickly, like just over here, tend um, a high GI. They tend to give you a, a sharper and more rapid increase in blood sugar levels. And these include things like white bread, um, potato, um, really sugary foods like lollies and soft drinks, refined breakfast cereals like um, cornflakes or rice bubbles and those sorts of things. Um, and then we have our low GI foods which tend to give a much more gradual and steadier rise in glu blood glucose levels. And these include things like multigrain bread, um, you know, oats, um, most types of fruit and pasta, basmati rice, sweet potato. However, um, just because a food is low GI and it's broken down a bit more slowly and tends to give you a more steady rise in blood glucose levels, that doesn't really tell you anything about the amount of carbohydrate. So just say, for example, if you were, you know, really hungry and you decided you wanted to have two big bowls of porridge for breakfast, you would still have high blood glucose levels after you've eaten breakfast because you've still had a large amount of carbohydrate in that one meal. Whereas, you know, the humble potato, which is high GI, if you just have a couple of small pieces of potato, um, your blood sugar levels aren't going to go up through the roof because you've only had such a small quantity. So although we do encourage people to choose more low GI foods, um, we still need to be mindful of portion sizes because large portions still have large amounts of carbohydrate 
that will still affect your sugar levels, whereas small portions will have a small portion of carbohydrate and won't affect them too much. Um, and also the glycemic index really doesn't tell you anything about how healthy a food is either. Um, well, I shouldn't use the word healthy, but the overall nutritional value of the food. So for example, it might surprise you, and this often shocks people, that chocolate and ice cream and corn chips are low GI foods. You know, common sense tells us that these foods aren't suitable foods to be eating all the time because they're high in fat, um, saturated fat, and they're high in added sugar. So, you know, and they really have no other vitamins or minerals or nutritional value. So we really do need to limit those foods even though they're low GI. And the reason they're low GI is because they have that fat in them. So fat will actually slow down the digestion and release of glucose into the bloodstream and means it's released a lot more gradually. But that doesn't mean they're healthy choices or everyday choices, I should say. Whereas potatoes and watermelon are high GI, but they're still fruits and veggies. You know, they still have vitamins and minerals, they're very low in saturated fat, and they can still play an important part of the diet, but we just need to watch our portion sizes. So although we do encourage you to choose more low GI foods, we still need to look at the overall nutritional value and our portion size as well. So just some practical ways that you can swap some high GI foods for low GI foods. So for example, going from white bread to a grain bread, a refined cereal to a less processed cereal like um, oats, or also anything that's based on barley or bran cereals will be low GI and good as well. So things like Guardian, All Bran, Natural Muesli, or anything from the Barley Max range are pretty good cereals. Um, switching from jasmine, which is a short grain rice, to um, a low GI, this is a low GI brown rice, um, and it's a, a longer grain variety of rice, but also things like basmati rice are a longer grain, lower GI choices as well, but remember, still be wary of portion size. Switching from a regular potato to a sweet potato, however, in small portions, regular potatoes shouldn't send your sugar levels up through the roof either. So what about sugar? And it's still a very, very common myth that once people are diagnosed with diabetes, you need to cut out all forms of sugar. Well, this isn't true. Um, by itself, sugar is a very low nutritional value. So there's nothing, you know, there's no vitamins or minerals or anything associated with sugar. It's just sugar. Our new dietary guidelines advise us to limit intake of foods that contain added sugar. So these include things like soft drinks, lollies, other confectionery, chocolates, biscuits, cakes, high sugar cereals, those sorts of things. Um, and to really limit those sorts of foods. Naturally occurring sugars in fresh fruit and low fat dairy products are still considered acceptable because they still have things like calcium, fiber, um, and um, other antioxidants as well. And small amounts of added sugar can be still included in the diet. So I mean things like, you know, for example, if you are having plain porridge, putting a teaspoon of sugar or a teaspoon of honey to make it a bit more tasty um, is certainly acceptable. And that one teaspoon of sugar or honey isn't going to send your sugar levels up through the roof, especially if you've included it in something that's really low GI like porridge. The release of that glucose into the bloodstream is going to be slowed down anyway. A thin spread of jam on some multigrain toast, tin fruit in natural juice or one teaspoon in, of sugar in your tea or coffee isn't too bad either, providing again you're not having you know, 10 or 15 cups of tea or coffee. Where we do get strict is limiting foods where the main ingredient is sugar, so things like sweet drinks and lollies, soft drinks, those sorts of things. Just to give you an example of how much sugar is in some foods, so a 600 ml bottle of soft drink has up to 63 grams of sugar, so that's quite a number of teaspoons there. 250 ml of juice has 25 grams of sugar, a, a typical V energy drink again has about 25 grams of sugar, so that's a lot of added sugar to our diet. Fibre. So why is fibre important? One of the first things that often people think of when they think of fibre is our bowels and going to the toilet regularly. And yes, that is a very important part of fibre in our diet is to make sure that we are not feeling constipated and we're going to the toilet and can prevent bowel cancer. But also fibre um, has other important roles in our diet as well. So a soluble fibre, you might have heard of soluble fibre before, this is the type of fibre that actually helps to reduce our cholesterol levels. Um, and it also can help to um, reduce blood sugar levels as well by making lowering the GI of the foods. So it means that the foods sit in our tummy for a lot longer um, and take a lot longer to break down and digest and can actually help keep you full for longer as well. 
So just some examples of ways that you can increase the fibre in your diet, including lots of veggies or salad at both lunch and dinner, eating legumes at least twice a week. So by legumes, I mean things like lentils, chickpeas, baked beans, four bean mix, and there's some tips down the bottom about how you can include more legumes in your diet. Um, snacking on vegetable sticks and low-fat dip or handfuls of unsalted nuts, making sure you're getting in two to three servings of fresh fruit, whole grain breads, brown rice, pasta, other grains, and choosing really high fibre cereals as well. So what about the fat in our diet? How does that impact on, on your health and your diabetes? So um, before I explain about the different types of fats, I'll explain about the different types of cholesterol. So you can see we've got our, our angel and our devil up here. So we'll start off with the bad guys, the LDL cholesterol. So this is what we call our bad cholesterol. It's what sticks to the walls of our arteries and our blood vessels and it clogs them up, causing blockages and increases the risk of a heart attack or a stroke. And then we have our good guy, the HDL cholesterol. So this is what travels around the body and actually helps to remove this bad stuff from the artery walls. Um, and higher levels of this good cholesterol can actually decrease the risk of having a heart attack or a stroke. So it's important that we're including um, sat unsaturated fats in the diet because unsaturated fats are great for our heart. They help to reduce LDL cholesterol. Some also help to increase the HDL cholesterol, so the good stuff. And omega-3 fats from oily fish, walnuts and linseeds can actually help to reduce triglycerides, which is another type of fat that's found in our blood, and reduce inflammation as well. And inflammation is one of the main, um, one of the main things that happens in our artery walls leading up to the heart attack or stroke. So just ways that you can include small amounts of unsaturated fats in your diet. So spreading avocado on sandwiches, toast and whole grain crackers. So avocado is a great source of healthy fats. Having a thin spread of peanut butter on toast. Um, snacking on handfuls of unsalted nuts. Eating oily fish two to three times a week. And good examples are really salmon, sardines um, and some varieties of tuna. And tinned fish in olive oil is fine or tinned fish in, in spring water is fine as well because often salmon can be quite expensive. Um, using margarine, not butter, because butter is a source of saturated fat and cooking with small amounts of healthy oils. But from a weight management point of view, it's important to limit these um, just a small amount. So I'm talking about a quarter of an avocado, you know, a tablespoon or two of peanut butter, a small handful of nuts, those sorts of things. Really limiting saturated and trans fats, so things like full cream, these are mainly animal fats, so things like full cream dairy products, fatty and processed meats like your deli meats, um, butter, cream, sour cream, mayonnaise, um, mainly your processed and packaged snack foods and takeaway foods because these foods are bad for your heart. They increase that bad cholesterol and they decrease the good cholesterol. So what about salt? So salt is our main um, dietary contributor to high blood pressure and a big risk factor for the development of heart disease and stroke. And salt is just as important as managing your carbohydrate intake um, when it comes to your health, your diabetes and, and your risk of heart disease. The Heart Foundation advises less than six grams of salt a day. That's less than one and a half teaspoons and most people would far exceed this just with things in our general diet like breads and sauces and um, cereals and cheese and that sort of thing. And most of the sodium or salt in our diet doesn't come from adding it at the table or while you're cooking, it comes from processed foods. So really need to limit like things like tinned and canned vegetables, sauces, soups or convenience meals or so looking for those that are low in sodium um, or have the Heart Foundation tick. Um, packaged snack foods like biscuits, crackers and chips, processed breakfast cereals, frozen and canned meals and takeaway foods. And looking for, if you, because sometimes you do need to buy these sorts of foods like canned sauces and things, but looking for those that say no added salt or low salt, salt reduced or the Heart Foundation tick. When looking at sodium on a label, always look at the per 100 grams to see how many milligrams of sodium it has. A low sodium food will have less than 120 milligrams, but you probably won't actually find that many packaged foods that have less than 120 milligrams. So probably aiming for between 120 to 450 and really limiting those that have more than 450. What about alcohol? So this is just to show you um, the different types of alcoholic drinks that a lot of um, people 
our age, because I'm a young person too, a lot of people our age might drink. So a glass of wine um, has you know, about 82 calories or no carbohydrates, so it's not going to affect your sugar levels, um, but the calories is what will contribute to weight gain. And this, I'm talking about a 120 ml standard glass of wine, maybe not what you would pour yourself at home. Um, a, a typical bottle of beer has about 150 calories, but look at these things like the Smirnoff Double Blacks and your um, energy alcoholic drinks, 270, 230 calories per one bottle or one can. So, um, and, and not to mention the carbohydrate value as well. So if you're drinking multiple ones of these on a night out, um, then that's really going to start to affect your weight and your sugar levels. In terms of the effect on our health, um, they're very high in calories, so contributing to weight gain. So a glass of wine, um, a standard glass of wine, would probably take you about 15 minutes of brisk walking to burn that off. So if you're having multiple glasses, just think about how much walking you might have to do to burn that off. Alcohol increases blood pressure, increases triglycerides, a different type of blood fat. Um, those that contain carbohydrate may raise blood glucose and for people on certain tablets or on insulin, there is the risk of that contributing to what we call low blood sugar levels or hypos. But the guidelines around alcohol consumption are no different to what they are to the general population. So aiming for no more than two standard drinks a day with some alcohol free days a week. Some practical tips for maintaining healthy eating habits and because you know it is about trying to incorporate them as a you know, as a sustainable change that you can maintain for the rest of your life. So one of the big things is preparing most of your meals rather than relying on takeaways. So, you know, if you're too busy for breakfast, leave some breakfast cereal, some whole grain bread or some fruit and yogurt at work so that you can, you know, eat your brekkie at work if you need to. Leave healthy snacks at work, you know, stock your desk drawers with all your fridge with you know your named products on them because they do go missing in some fridges at work, um, such as fruit, low fat yogurt, whole grain crackers with cottage cheese, unsalted nuts. Taking your lunch rather than relying on buying it all the time because not only is that expensive but you know it does add up in terms of calories too. So things like healthy sandwiches, wraps or salads, leftovers from the previous night. Or things like preparing a big batch of soup or salad perhaps on a Sunday afternoon so that you've got it for the rest of the week to take to work. Um, or preparing meals in bulk and freezing. And I'm someone, you know, I, I live alone and I have to cook for myself and um, I can't tell you how, how great this is for nights when I do have to work late or, you know, I'm, I'm not getting home or I just can't be bothered cooking. It's just having something in the freezer that I can easily defrost. I can't stress enough how important planning and preparation is. So planning your meals and snacks for the week ahead. So before you do your grocery shop, um, have a think about what you're going to cook for dinner every night. Have a think about what you're going to take to work. Um, write a shopping list and stick to it and never ever go shopping when you're hungry because you will pick up things that you don't need. Using smaller plates or bowls, avoiding eating in front of the TV. Um, and this is really important as well because often when we eat in front of the telly, um, it leads to mindless overeating. So we're not concentrating on what we're eating, we're concentrating on the TV, we feel like eating more, um, we tend to eat quicker as well. So if you eat at the table, this slows down your eating um, and makes you feel more satisfied. You actually feel like you've eaten a meal because you're concentrating on enjoying it too. In terms of takeaway or eating out, um, if possible, really try to try to limit takeaway or eating out no more than once a week if possible. Sometimes, you know, when it gets really busy socially, um, you might be eating out a bit more. Um, but healthy choices for when you are eating out, so um, it could be if you're buying your lunch, a whole grain roll, sandwich or wrap with a lean source of protein like chicken or turkey or egg or tuna and lots of salad. Um, an Asian based stir fry with lean chicken, beef or seafood and plenty of vegetables and just a small portion of steamed rice an entree sized pasta dish with a tomato based sauce, thin based pizza with vegetarian toppings but asking for less cheese, grilled fish or skinless barbecue chicken with salad, sushi or sashimi but avoiding those that um, are tempura or fried, um, a plain hamburger with lean meat and lots of salad or jacket potatoes with baked beans and salad. Another option is if you're going to something like a pub then just getting a, a grilled steak with vegetables um, and or salad and if things comes with chips then just ask for them for extra salad or extra veggies rather than getting the chips. Um, but of course, you know, I, I think once a week people, you know, should be able to, to go out and enjoy whatever they like. But if you're eating out more than once a week, then you do really need to make most of your choices healthy choices. So what about physical activity? 
So physical activity, a lot of people I think just focus on weight management when it comes to physical activity and that's the reason why they're exercising. And that is a very important um, part of physical activity is helping to manage your weight. But however, even if you were to lose no weight whatsoever, just being more active will improve your insulin sensitivity. So it makes it easier for your insulin to work and it lowers your blood glucose levels. It lowers cholesterol, it lowers blood, blood pressure, it increases the strength in your bones and muscles which is really important as you get older so that you don't end up like a frail old man or a frail old lady so that you can remain independent as you become older. Improves your mental health so it's a great stress relief. Improves your sleeping habits um, and just makes you feel better about yourself as well when you're more active. Increases happy hormones or endorphins. The guidelines around physical activity, well, just for those health benefits that I mentioned before, um, they suggest to aim for 30 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity on most days of the week. However, for weight loss, you're probably looking at more like 60 to 90 minutes a day for weight loss. Um, and this doesn't have to be done all at once, like you could do half an hour in the morning and half an hour in the evening or break this up into two sessions or even gradually build up to that if you haven't done anything for a while. Um, or it can be done in smaller blocks as 10 to 15 minutes. As long as you accumulate that 60 to 90 minutes for weight loss, it doesn't matter you know, if you do it in 10 to 15 minute blocks, but really work hard in those 10 to 15 minute blocks. What about physical inactivity? So, I mean, studies show that, you know, even if you do your hour of exercise a day, if you're sitting down for the remaining 23 hours of the day, that's still not great in terms of your health. So, for people who sit down for eight hours a day, and I'm, I'm guilty, I'm one of those people, um, and for people who watch more than two hours of TV in leisure time or, you know, do two hours of, you know, playing computer games or reading, there's still increased risk of chronic disease. And that person who does 60 minutes of physical activity a day but still sits down for the rest of the day is what we call the active couch potato. So there are ways that you can increase incidental activity um, in addition to doing your plan 30 to 60 to 90 minutes. So things like using the stairs rather than taking the lift, parking further away in car parks, doing chores whilst watching TV, continually getting up to get a glass of water, if you catch public transport, getting off a stop earlier and perhaps walking part of the way or standing up on public transport as well. Aerobic activity can include anything that gets your heart rate up. So walking, jogging, swimming, bike riding, aerobics. Um, it should increase your heart rate and leave you feeling slightly out of breath. Improves heart and lung function, improves insulin sensitivity, so it helps your um, it helps your insulin to work better and lower your blood glucose levels. And we should aim to do 30 minutes most days of the week. Resistance activity, so um, this could be weights, resistance bands or exercises using your own body weight, anything that creates a resistance, so things like squats, lunges, bicep curls and aiming to do resistance activity at least twice a week and the reason for this is because it builds muscle. Muscle is the biggest user of glucose from our blood, so the more muscle you have, the more glucose you're going to be using all the time even when you're resting and this helps to keep blood glucose levels um, lower. You don't necessarily have to go to a gym to do resistance exercise. An exercise physiologist can help to develop a safe home exercise program for you. Either check your community health centre or ask your GP for a referral. And lastly, just to finish off with a couple of um, programs that we run at Diabetes Australia. So one of them is called our Getting Started program. So this is a type 2 diabetes education program that we run here in our city office. It's a five and a half hour session um, with both a dietitian and a diabetes educator. It's free for members of Diabetes Australia and $15 for non-members and we do run them on a monthly basis. Um, we do run some out of hours, we do run two a year that are um, evening based um, sessions but we've actually just finished those for the year um, but we will be running um, more throughout the day for the, rest, the remaining months of the year um, but also we'll be planning them more evening sessions for next year as well. Supermarket tours. So supermarket tours are run right throughout Victoria um, and they run from March through to November. They're a two hour tour conducted by a local dietitian so we don't run them ourselves but we recruit or get dietitians to volunteer their time to run them for us. Talks about label reading, selecting healthy food choices, um, healthy products um, and again free for members of Diabetes Australia and $15 for non-members and you'll get, a super, uh, you'll get a show bag for lots of goodies and a copy of our healthy shopping guide. 
So this is a, a pocket-sized booklet that has um, over 1,200 suggested food products, the, you know, the, the more nutritious choices to make. Um, it retails for normally $7.50, um, but if you do a supermarket tour, you get it for free as part of that. And you can order it from our online shop um, or come into our, into our store or um, over the phone, um, and it's free postage to members as well. Just some ways that you can access the dietitian, so your local community health centre, um, the Dietitians Association of Australia on their website will have a section that says find an accredited practicing dietitian. And here at Diabetes Australia we have both dietitians and diabetes educators um, on call Monday to Friday from 9 to 4. And we're available to answer any questions that you have about diabetes. If you just give this phone number a call, um, you'll get put through to a call centre and they will set, direct your call to the appropriate person. Places you can go for more information, so our website, the Australian Dietary Guidelines website, the Better Health Channel, or for information about specific food products, um, the Calorie King website and app is great. And that's it. Any questions? Okay. Um, we do have um, one question. So somebody has said, I find portion sizes so hard living by myself. Um, any tips? Well, I live by myself as well um, and it, it can be hard, um, especially when it comes to things like buying um, meat, like um, steak and chicken and things like that. But I tend to buy them in bulk and cut them into the appropriate portion sizes um, and then freeze them. Um, for things when it comes to meat, Meals. Often I do make things that serve four or that serve two, um, but I'll break them up into the appropriate portion sizes and then, you know, into containers um, and then either freeze them or store them. Um, so I hope that kind of answers your questions there or, you know, if you can buy things in bulk and freeze them, then that's probably one of the best options. Um, and it says, Another question was, it's hard to find tinned fruit in natural juice. It is usually in refined juice or fruit juice. What should we look for when selecting tinned fruit? Well, fruit juice is actually natural juice. Um, and fruit juice is actually natural juice. It, the ones that you really need to avoid are those that say in syrup. So if it says in if it says in refined juice, if it says in fruit juice or natural juice, that's fine. We're just really avoiding those that say um, in in syrup. Okay. Okay. So um, it says there's another question. It says fruit has sucrose, which I'm told is as bad as glucose. Can you please clarify? So um, fruit has fructose in it. So um, sucrose is our table sugar or our added sugar um, that we use in, in food processing or, or when we're cooking things. Um, so there has been some um, there has been some media um, some information in the media that says fructose is is bad for you, and this is really referring to the American population that use high fructose corn syrup um, in a lot of their food processing and. This particular type of sugar has been linked um, to health problems, but we don't use that in Australia. And certainly fruit contains fructose, but it's only usually in small amounts. Um, and, or I mean, it's only usually in small amounts. So in an average piece of fruit, you're probably looking at about, um, you know, 10 to 15 grams of, of fructose um, or carbohydrate. Um, and all carbohydrate foods, whether it's coming from something like fruit um, or whether it's coming from a starchy food, gets broken down into glucose at the end of the day and released into the bloodstream. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing because we will use up some of this for energy. It's just about, you know, watching our portion sizes more than anything else. So um, a couple of average pieces or medium pieces of fruit a day um, isn't going to, to affect your health and is still quite good for us. So I hope that answers that question. Um, and then there was another question about how to best avoid hypos. Um, so this question, um, so this question really is quite individual. So um, for this particular person, um, if you're on medications that, tablets that are causing hypos or if, 
are you injecting insulin? Um, and it might mean that you need to have a review with either both your dietitian and your diabetes educator to adjust your medication doses um, because what will be happening is, um, you know, hypos or low blood sugar levels are caused by either too much insulin um, when we're injecting insulin or caused by um, too much of medications that um, cause our body to produce more insulin. Um, and if you're not eating enough carbohydrate, then this can lead to a hypo. So it's probably best that for this particular person, you do need to have a review with your diabetes educator um, and or your dietitian as well to adjust your um, to adjust your medications so that you're not having any hypos because the best way to avoid hypos is to make sure that you're eating enough carbohydrate. But really, we would prefer people um, to alter their, their medications so that they're not at risk of having um, hypos rather than increasing carbohydrate intake. And last question um, is about sugar substitutes. So are there guidelines about using these? So these include things like um, your artificial sweeteners, so things like equal, um, splendor, um, those sorts of things. Um, and look, we don't actively encourage people to use these things. We really say there's no need for alternative sweeteners or sugar substitutes in the diet. Um, and it really depends on you know how much sugar that you're using in your diet in the first place. So as I mentioned before on, on one of my slides, small amounts of sugar can still be included in a healthy diet without impacting on blood sugar levels or without impacting on weight too much. So you know a teaspoon here or there. If that's all you're using in your diet is you know you're popping a teaspoon of sugar on top of your porridge or you know the occasional teaspoon of sugar in tea or coffee, then you probably don't need to switch to a sugar substitute. Um, and as long as you're using small amounts of sugar in your diet anyway. Um, but there are natural forms of sugar substitutes, so things like stevia, um, which is a completely natural sweetener. Um, if, if you prefer to use those, then that's probably one of, one of the better ones to choose. Um, because you know, although sugar substitutes um, like Equal and, and Splendor and, and those that are, are chemically manufactured, although they've been tested by Food Standards Australia and New Zealand and they're considered safe for consumption, and they are in the quantities that most people um, eat them in are, are generally safe, they really haven't been around for that long that we really have any solid long-term evidence um, on the effects that they have on our health if somebody's been consuming them for 50 or 60 years because they haven't been around for that long. And you know, they really don't add any nutritional value to the diet. So I really tell people, you know, um, if you're only using small amounts of sugar in your diet, continue with doing that. And, and things that are artificially sweetened like soft drinks and lollies and those sorts of things should still really only be consumed in small amounts because they're not really offering any nutritional value to the diet. So just occasional consumption. And that's it. I'll hand you back over to Angela. Thank you, everybody, for um, tuning into today's webinar. And thank you, Adele. I'm sure everybody wants to join with me in, in thanking you for putting this together. I know I found it extremely useful. And actually, we've had a couple of questions from people asking if they'll be able to watch it again. And just to reassure everybody that um, we will be putting it up on our website. So I know I think it's going to be a very valuable resource that people can refer to again and again because there's such a lot of really useful information in there. So um, that now concludes our webinar. And as I just said, I'll be sending you out an email in the next couple of days with a link to this webinar and also perhaps with a survey where you can maybe um, just give us some feedback on the webinars and that will help us plan for future webinars and if you'd like to put on that what topics you'd like me to concentrate on that would be brilliant. Um, thank you very much for joining us tonight and um, hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night. <laughs>